Oh Lord, we come to you in prayer because we need your help. We're not simply praying before a sermon because that's how we think sermons begin. We need your help to listen, to learn, to hear. I need your help to speak clearly, humbly, in the power of the Spirit. You have been so good to us, and so we ask that you would be good to us yet again. Pierce through the noise, the distraction of our lives. Speak to our hearts just what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus chapter 32, verses 15 through 24. As we continue with our series through Exodus, and in particular these last few weeks, and for the next several weeks, the episode involving the golden calf in Exodus 32 through 34. Tonight, chapter 32, verses 15 through 24, page 72 in your pew Bibles. Follow along as I read. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back, they were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder And scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Hmm. You know the moment in The Grinch, the old cartoon version, where he imagines all the boys and the girls in Whoville opening their presents, and he says to himself, Noise, noise, noise. Does your life feel like that? My life feels like that on a lot of days. Especially if you're a parent. We have a very nice piano in our dining room. Mind you, none of the children have had piano lessons, but they all like to play it. Like to have some of the George children over maybe and hear them play it, but that can be one layer of noise in the house. Of course, there is the layer of just kids being kids, running, wrestling, screaming, crying, stomping, slamming. Then there's the layer most unfortunate, and that's the layer that comes from the parents at times when they snap and the inner Grinch comes out. Noise, noise, noise. No roast beast for you, Cindy Lou Who. You have noise. But not all noise is the same. There is the noise of disobedience and disorder, even among children. And then there is the noise of kids being kids, of laughter and playing and fort building and tickling and teasing. It's loud, but it's a different noise. There are likely all sorts of noises in your life, even if you find your house perhaps more quiet than it used to be. I want to talk about three different noises, three different sounds in the Christian life. We're going to spend most of our time with two of them in this text, and then we're going to connect the dots to a New Testament episode where, again, we see God coming down to visit his sinful 
people. And in each of these, we will see and hear the noise, the sounds in the Christian life. Which sound is prevalent in your Christian walk at the moment? Here's the first sound in Exodus 32, verses 15 through 20, the first half. It is the sound of sinning. In particular, it's the sound of sinful singing. Normally, we think of singing as something very good, and usually in Scripture it is. The last time we encountered God's people singing, it was Exodus 15. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. That was a song, a great song. But here in Exodus 32, the Israelites are singing a different song. It's the sound of sinning. Here's what they're singing. Go back to verse 4. And they said, middle of the verse, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. We don't know if that's the actual words they were singing to a tune, but that's certainly the gist of what they are communicating. You come to verse 18, and scholars debate exactly how to translate the verse, but there's clearly some sort of revelry in the camp. I think the ESV gets the basic idea right. It's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat. That would be one thing, but it's the sound of singing. Moses comes down. He has an idea of what's going on because he's already heard from the Lord. Remember that the people have broken out in rebellion. Now Joshua, his right-hand man, is in the dark. So Moses comes down with, with hints from the Lord that you are not going to like what you find down there when you come. Sometimes my wife will let me know on the way home from work. Just want you to be prepared. We haven't had a chance to really address the house today. Okay, or the dinner isn't quite ready yet. Well, this is much, much worse. But Joshua doesn't know. So as he is there on the lookout, on the listen out, he hears what sounds like perhaps a cacophony of war or defeat. But it's singing. It's probably a riotous combination of dancing and music and drinking and sensuality. In other words, the pagan frat house is really a rockin' as they come down there. Red solo cups, lampshades on their heads, smells you don't want to know about, couch cushions turned upside down, thick smoke, and lots of singing. Singing isn't the problem, but it's what singing represents. Miriam and the women danced for the king of the universe in chapter 15, but now the men and women dance not for a king, but for a cow. Sin was their celebration. Now, you you know this, and we know it from experience, if we're honest. Sin, at least in the moment, doesn't usually make us miserable. Now, there are occasions people in the mire of addiction, and even when they're doing the sinning, there's no joy in it. But many times, oftentimes, there is joy in that moment of sinning or happiness, if you don't want to use a spiritual sounding word, you sin because you like it. That's what the devil said to Adam and Eve in the garden. You see that fruit? That's a good looking fruit. That's going to do good things for you. God's keeping something from you. And hasn't the devil whispered the same thing in our ears a thousand times? Do you know what you're missing out? If you would just pursue that relationship, if you would just, if you would just go after that guy or girl, even though they're not a Christian, if you would just have that flirtatious relationship, if you would just click over there, if you would watch that, if you would just participate in that little bit of gossip, if you would just find that connection with your friend at church over the same person that you both don't like, if you would just do it, there would be great delight. We sin because we enjoy it. I've found this over the years in trying to do evangelism or mobilize people for evangelism. Yes, there's a very important place for having an answer to the questions people may have, the intellectual dilemmas, the apologetic concerns. But sometimes we give people too much credit. Very often it comes down to this. 
I like the life I'm living and I don't really want God to get in the way of it. I'm doing things that I like. I don't particularly feel bad about them. You're telling me this gospel about there's some tremendous bad news and God is angry with me. I sure don't feel that. I kind of like what I'm doing. And if you want to sort of make your life more difficult and go to church and not do some fun things, I'm going to go ahead doing what I like to do. This scene is a massive spring break beach party. And Moses comes down to see it. And the Lord is not happy, though they were in that moment with the music blaring and the tambourines and the singing and the dancing, they were happy. Often people are wondrously happy when they're sinning. That's why you realize as fallen human beings, we are not very good judges of what we're doing, whether it is right or wrong. Yes, we have a conscience, but it's easy for that conscience to become seared, to become cauterized. How often do you hear people say in one fashion or another, but I feel so satisfied when I do this. Why would, why would God give me this desire if he didn't want me to act upon it? Well, that presumes that all the desires you have in your heart are God's desires. It presumes that all the things that I might want to do in my flesh are things that God wants me to do. But we need to have a better anthropology than that. We're fallen human beings. We're twisted. We're perverted. And so we can live a life and we can have many great weekends and experiences feeling like, yes, I had nothing but delight in that. And it can still be sin. Psalm 73. Remember Asaph said his feet had almost stumbled. His steps had nearly slipped. I was envious of the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they seem healthy. They seem happy. He said, they don't have troubles. They're singing their way through the worship of golden calves. Have you ever felt that way looking out in the world? Well, look at all those people just singing their way with golden calves. And here I am trying to follow Jesus stuck in the mire. It feels like that. Sin can make you very happy for a season, but we'll get to the end in a moment. Moses comes down. Now, he is not a happy camper with the camp. We read verse 19, his anger burned hot. It's one thing to hear of this wild behavior, and it's another to see it for yourself. Notice God does not fault Moses for his anger. This is not a sinful bit of road rage. Moses is right to be furious. This phrase in verse 19, Moses' anger burned hot, is normally used of God. In fact, you look up at verse 10, and the same phrase there is used for God. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. So Moses is righteously angry. And in his righteous anger, he does two things. First... Notice, he throws down the tablets of the law. These are the tablets of the testimony written on front and back with the finger of God. We know from the end of chapter 24 and other parts of the Bible, like Hebrews, that the tablets contain the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. And it says something surely about the uniqueness and the permanent nature of the Ten Commandments that they alone were written on stone permanence with the very finger of God. They were meant to be foundational for all the other civil and ceremonial laws that would follow. And when Moses throws them down, don't think that he's just having a a outburst of rage and just dashing a newspaper off the table and throwing stuff onto the ground. He is quite deliberately in a symbolic and deliberate act, smashing the tablets of the testimony. Remember back in chapter 24 at the foot of the mountain, the people gathered to swear allegiance to this covenant. Go back to chapter 24. Verse three, Moses came, told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules and all the people answered with one voice. All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. So here we are again. Now go to verse 19 of chapter 32. Where is Moses 
But he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain, quite deliberately. So not just he's upset and smash him down, but this is a symbolic gesture right there where we built an altar, where you consecrated yourselves, where you professed with a vow that you would obey the Lord your God. You have disobeyed him with the foulest kind of rank rebellion and revelry. And so, of course, these are the covenant stipulations. It's as if in our day there's a, there's a contract between God and his people. And now when he sees them, he rips it in two because that's what they've done. They've spat upon the covenant. They've ripped apart the contract. And so Moses deliberately cast down the tablets at the foot of the mountain. Do you catch the symbolism? They are covenant breakers. And so it is fitting that Moses would break the tablets of the covenant at the very same spot at the foot of the mountain. Because in essence, it wasn't God who broke those tablets. It was the people of God in their rebellion. They broke them and Moses is reflecting to them what they have already done. That's the first thing. Now, the second thing he does seems to us like maybe it's extreme. He not only smashes the tablets, but you notice at verse 20, he took the calf, he burned it with fire, ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, made the people of Israel drink it. The fact that it was burned with fire means it may have been wood overlaid with gold, ground it up into powder, so you have ash, If you're burning wood, you have some sort of sludge from gold melted down. And in this sludge, you scatter it on the water source and you make people drink it. Now, Moses is punishing the people. But again, we need to understand deliberately what he's doing. This isn't like your your mom, moms of yesteryear. Maybe some moms still do this. You know, washing your mouth out with soap. Sit at that table and if you have that sort of mouth, those sort of words come out of your mouth and you're going to drink this cup of vinegar before you leave here. All sorts of good things that moms comes up with. That's not what Moses is doing. He's not simply saying, bad dog, look what you've done. Now you're going to drink it all down. Okay? You didn't eat your vegetables. Now you're going to sit there and you're going to like it. That's not what he's doing. This is a deliberate, symbolic act. Because think about it. What has he ground up into powder? Their God. This was a way of utterly destroying and absolutely humiliating their deity. They had just got done dancing and singing about this God who delivered them out of Egypt. And Moses is saying, that's the God you want? The God I just burned up, the, the God scattered out, obliterated, never to be reconstituted, some God, some deliverer. He was destroyed, he was digested, and not to be too earthy about it, but later he was to be defecated by the very people he was supposed to save. That's the point that Moses is making. He's reminding them, you think that's your God. You think that's the I am that spoke to me. You think that's the God who brought the ten plagues. You think that's the God who who parted the, the Red Sea. You think that's the God who gave you manna in the wilderness, quail from heaven. You think that's the God who gave you water from the rock. You think that's the God of the, the, the fire and the cloudy pillar. You think that's the God whose glory is going to inhabit the tabernacle. That's a box covered with gold to look like a cow. Some God, you're going to drink that God. You're going to pass out that God. That's not the deity you want. Mark it well, Moses is saying. This singing, this sinning only lasts for a season. In the end, our idols cannot save, they cannot satisfy, and they cannot stand so remember what I said just a, just a few moments ago, people like sinning. It's like uh, this is a beach party for spring break with all of its revelry and sensuality. You ever meet people 
living their entire life like it's a party on spring break, you know what? They're not very happy. They are among the most miserable people. And if they're not miserable, you can guarantee they're making all the people around them miserable. (laughs) Thinking that life is just one bit of drunken sensuality and the next and the next and the next and the next. It's bad enough, of course, as a college student, not excusing it there either. But you have that which seems so enjoyable for a moment and you try to live your life like that. You try to have a job like that. You try to raise a family like that. You leave a marriage in tatters. You leave your kids in, in shambles. You live your financial state in ruin. The idols always let you down. They never come through for you. That's what God is reminding the people. That's what God wants to remind us. You think this golden calf is something special? This calf did not save you. This calf cannot save you. So first we have the sound of sinning. It's the sound of sinful singing and revelry in the camp. But there's a second sound. And if that first sound didn't seem to strike your conscience, then this second sound may. It's not the sound of sinning. It's the sound of shifting. See, Moses is upset with Aaron, but he gives Aaron, his big brother, a chance to explain himself. He says in verse 21, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? That phrase, a great sin, is almost always used for sexual sin. It's used in the context of Joseph with Potiphar's wife or the men of Sodom were great sinners And when it's not used for physical adultery, it's used for spiritual adultery or idolatry. Just another suggestion that what they were doing down there wasn't just that they were singing some song with explicit lyrics, but they were doing all the things that pagans do in their worship. Moses is coming to Aaron, and I think he's coming, giving Aaron an honest chance to try to explain himself. There's a verse, which you may not have noticed before, in Deuteronomy 9.20, which says, And the Lord was so angry with Aaron that he was ready to destroy him. This is Moses speaking. And I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Isn't that amazing? You got any brothers here in this room? Is that what you would do with your big brother? I think most of the little brothers would say, Oh, (laughs) this is going to be a good day. Dad comes home and sees what big brother did. But Moses said, God was furious. And so I made a point to pray for Aaron. I think Moses is trying to give Aaron the benefit of the doubt. Aaron, how did this great sin happen? What do you have to say for yourself? And Aaron's response, he does not acquit himself well. Instead of admitting his faults, he passes the buck. That's why I have called this the sound of Shifting, that is blame shifting. Picture that. This happens so so much, doesn't it? Kids, adults, students, doesn't matter how old you are, you've all seen this, and I bet you've all done this. You you've done something wrong. And whether it's mom, dad, husband, wife, teacher, coach, whomever, pastor, elder, presbytery, whatever, okay, here it is. It's, it's called responsibility. It's called accountability. Sort of, here it is. And why do we use that language of blame shifting? Because here it is. There's some blame to be laid at your feet for sins, for decisions that you made. And then we shift it. It's right here for us. And this is where, if you are a mature Christian, what does the Christian do? It's hard for us takes humility, you have some of that blame. You say, I deserve that. I own that. I did that. Now, it's true, people can put blame on us that isn't truly ours, but when it is, we own it. But that's not the way most of us respond. We try to think, here comes 
the blame right here, and we do one of these. Whoa. <laughs> That's, oh, that sermon almost got me. Oh, God almost said something that struck my heart. Better, Oh, that Bible reading seemed like it was almost for me. I better quick duck out of the way because that's probably good for somebody else to hear. It's not my blame. That's not my fault. And so he shifts. Look at what he does. He blames other people. He blames other people. He says in verse 22, the people are set on evil. Verse 23, they told me to make them gods. Are you like this? It's always someone else's fault. It's not to say that other people don't contribute to our problems. They do at times. It's not to say that your history doesn't matter. It's not to say that there's not real injustice in the world. There is. But listen, are you one who is always, always someone else's fault? It's always, it was your parents. It's your kids. It's your coach. It's your teacher. It's your pastor. It's the government. It's the season of life. It's the media, it's Hollywood, it's, all, it's, it's always something else, always someone else. This is what Aaron is saying. Moses, you know what they're like. Come on. Didn't have much choice in the matter. He blames other people. Notice what he also does. He blames the messenger. That's always popular. See, it's very subtle, but it's there in verse 23. He repeats... What they've already said, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. It's Aaron's way of saying, hey, <laughs> little brother, I mean, you weren't here exactly. I'm, I'm just reporting what the people said. Some of the people, now I'm, I'm not saying it's me, not saying, just saying. You ever do one of those? I'm not saying that dress makes you look bad. I'm just saying, nope, stop. Don't finish that sentence. Most of the time when you do, I'm not just saying, I'm just saying, just don't even go there. That's what Aaron said. I'm not, I'm not, but some of the people, just, re, just reply, some of the people are saying that, you know, they didn't know where you were, Moses. They couldn't see you. You weren't around. You kind of disappeared. We didn't know where you were. See, he's blame shifting. He's, it's, it's, it's the messenger now. It's, it's Moses. You can count on this more often than not. When you confront sinful people about their sin, they will redirect the conversation to be about your sin. Something you did to make their sin excusable or unavoidable. Now, certainly we are sinners. And Jesus did say to take the log out of our own eye before we go picking specks out of other people's eyes. But it so often is the case. You go... No matter how humbly you try to present to someone something that they immediately turn it around. What about you? What about your sin? Blame the messenger. He blames other people. He blames the messenger. And he blames ultimately his circumstances. This is worst of all. And you were right to give it a chuckle because you don't know to laugh or to cry. Verse 24. Let any who have gold take out so they gave it to me. I threw it in the fire. Boom. Golden calf. Totally weirdest thing ever, Moses. I just didn't, it was so strange. I threw it in there. I didn't know. There's like a magician's wand. There's something. Golden calf. It just, and then the dancing and one thing led to another. I don't know. It just happened. He blames the circumstances. You notice this construction and out came this calf. There's, there's no subject to that. There's no I, there's no we, there's just a passive construction. It's that famous, infamous political phrase, which political parties have said since the beginning of time, and you can find it on both sides of the aisle. Mistakes were made. <laughs> Mistakes were made. Oh, such a wonderfully awful phrase, because of course it doesn't say what they were, who did, they just, they're just out there somewhere, mistakes were made. See, you could say, I regret, that's personal responsibility. We regret, well, maybe that's sort of diffusing it, but if there's more than one person involved, that's appropriate. Then you could go to the next step and you might say, well, the institution or the organization or the company regrets. Well, that's making it impersonal. And then you could go to the next step, and make it entirely ambiguous, it is regretted, or you could go all the way and just say regrettably. You see how the difference, you see how we all do that with human language? 
You say, well, we're still expressing regret. Yes, but you're finding a passive construction so that you yourself don't have to own up to any of these actions. You see, this is Aaron's press release. You know, it's all over the internet. Golden calf, golden calf, golden calf. News at 11, golden calf. And he issues a press release from the soon-to-be high priest. Headline, mistakes were made. Well, me, I, I mean, you weren't here, Moses. People are terrible. And I threw in some gold and the, just this thing happened. You can see what Aaron has done. It's the same thing we tend to do when caught in sin. Here's what we do. He turns himself into a minor character when he was one of the chief actors. This is what we do as sinners. I've done it. You've done it. In triumphs, you're the main character of the play. In sin, you were just a bit player. Some great success. You were there in a leading role. Actor and actress, you were there. Some sin, ah, maybe I was around. I, didn't, I wasn't the main person involved. Maybe I was sort of tangentially related. That's what Aaron does. He uses all the excuses we use. It's not my fault. I had no choice. It just happened. People made me do it. I, 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 I you know, lost my temper. I'm, I'm, I'm growing in this area. It's a growth curve. It's a learning edge. The fire made me do it. Excuses. Do you hear the same sound? If not the sound of sinful singing, perhaps you hear the sound of shifting in your life. Don't think about others in your life who who do this. Consider your own heart. Think about how easily you pass it off to someone else. It's not my responsibility. It's not my fault. That's just the way I am. We have removed so much in our age, human agency, that human beings make real choices, that we're not just the products of our environment. We're not just, life is not just determined by our, you know, whether you're male or female or whether you're black and white or whether you're rich or poor. All of those things will matter and have a shaping influence for sure. But we actually have human agency. We make decisions. We are accountable We are responsible. Like Aaron, we're always finding ways to shift the blame. The sound of sinning. The sound of shifting. And let me in conclusion bring you to one other sound. And I said I would connect the dots with a New Testament story because here we have God visiting his people. We have the man of God, Moses, who who is coming down from the mountain to find the people in a state of sinful rebellion. There's a story sort of like this, one familiar to all of you, where God comes to visit his people and he sees them in the state of their sinful rebellion. But there we have not the sound of singing, not the sound of shifting, but we have the sound of sobbing. Luke 19, and when Jesus drew near, And saw the city of Jerusalem, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Do you hear some of the parallels? Tearing down to the ground, visiting, surrounding stones, torn down stones, thrown down to the ground. But whereas Moses, righteously so, came down in an expression of anger, here we have the Lord Jesus, infinitely more holy than Moses, who comes And though he predicts this judgment to come, in this moment, it is not the sound of his anger that we hear, but it is the sound of his weeping. As Moses approached the camp, he was smashing mad. As Jesus approached the city, he was weeping sad. 
And for the same reason, the people who should have known better didn't. That ought to be a sobering thing because if there are any people in all the land who qualify as the people who should know better, it's people like us. It's people like most of us in this room who have had thousands of Bible studies, heard tens of thousands of sermons, who know all sorts of hymns and and songs and know all sorts of Bible lessons. Jesus says that those who have been given such a great privilege have a great responsibility and will be judged more severely for the light that they have. So may it not be that Jesus would ever approach the city of Charlotte or heaven forbid, a place like Christ's covenant and weep and say, oh, that you had only known. If Jesus were here, would he look over your life and weep? You have reason to believe. You have days and have had years to consider Jesus. And perhaps we do not know the trials that are coming just as they did not on that Palm Sunday Perhaps Jesus is saying over us, you do not know the things that make for peace. You did not know that this is the time of your visitation. Maybe you're even here tonight and you always think there's another day, there's another year to get serious about Jesus. Just like they always thought in Jerusalem, there'd be another time, but eventually their time was up. Sooner or later, our sins will be confronted. Sooner or later, even if you're having the time of your life at the foot of the mountain, God comes down to see the golden calf. Maybe it will be a swift judgment like Sinai, or maybe it will be delayed, but it will happen. God will not be mocked, but he can be satisfied. It's not too late to turn the sobs into salvation. Think about it. The tablets at that moment in Exodus 32 were the most valuable, precious material thing on planet Earth earth. There was no holier artifact anywhere. The tabernacle, we had instructions, hadn't been built yet. The ark, not been built yet. There was nothing, no physical thing of holier value than the tablets. And they were smashed because of human sin. And fast forward 1,500 years later to Jerusalem, the most precious physical thing was not a stone but a person and God's son was torn in two for sinful people they broke the covenant and their false god was destroyed we break the covenant and the true god is put to death and because of that there is yet hope to turn the sound of sinning And the sound of shifting and the sound of sobbing into the sound of salvation in your life. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus, whose body was given up for our sakes of infinitely more value than any stone tablets wasn't just the tablets of the covenant, but the very Lord of the covenant crucified for our sakes. We who were at the foot of the mountain sinning and singing and shouting and far from you. And you came that we might have hope, that we might have salvation, that we might be brought near even when we were so far from you. Lord, may we always count it a precious thing, a holy thing, that you would send your son to die for us. Turn us, Lord. We've heard this gospel message before, but surely for some in this room it has not really taken root, some young person, some old person who's been at church their whole life, And we have been shifting and we have been wandering. Bring us back, O Lord, that we might serve the one true, only living God in whose name we pray. Amen.